Thanks, Nicole. Good afternoon and welcome. I'd like to call to order the April 26th, 2023 City of Asheville Multimodal Transportation Commission meeting. My name is Dennis Wenzel and I am the chair of this group. Our meetings continue to be held virtually, but there are many ways for interested parties to participate in this gathering. The City of Asheville's engagement hub, which includes a variety of, variety of links and phone numbers can be found on the Multimodal Transportation Commission page of the City of Asheville's website. Visiting this page is the best way to take part in our virtual meetings. Members, staff, and guests, please remember to keep your microphones muted at all times so when you're not speaking so we can minimize feedback and other, round back, other uh, background noises. I'd like to now welcome our commission members. Members, when I introduce you, please uh, uh, introduce yourself and let us know what interest you represent. Randy Warren, uh, Randy is actually traveling and unable to join us today. Uh, Kenny Armstrong. I don't see Kenny on your point yet. Uh, Jack Eigelman. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jack Eigelman. I'm an at large member. Hey, Jack. Leanna Joyner. Leanna Joyner. I represent uh, the Active Transportation Committee. Hey, Leanna. Pat Katz. Let's see Pat on here. Don't yet hopefully soon uh, bill office bill is unable to uh, join us today uh joe chesler joe i'm not able to hear you all right he's here with us looks like we'll get that resolved soon uh elise martyr hi i'm elise um pedestrian and uh greenway interest hey elise welcome uh joe archibald hey everyone uh joe archibald uh liaison to multimodal from the planning and zoning commission and active pedestrian and bike user hey joe uh elizabeth Likas. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Likas and I am the liaison from the Neighborhood Advisory Committee and uh, avid biker and pedestrian as well. Great, welcome Elizabeth. And Maggie Allman. Hey y'all, Maggie Allman, I'm the liaison from City Council, glad to be here. Glad to have you. Thanks everybody. Uh, Joe? Yeah, just uh, let me know I'm on again. Joe Chesler. Excellent. Thanks, Joe. Glad we got that worked out. Okay. Uh, first item of business is to review and approve the agenda for this meeting, April 26, 2023. Can I get a motion to approve? I'll make a motion okay. to approve, Dennis. Uh, thank you, Jack. And a second. Second, Joe. Um, any comments or questions on today's agenda? Get a lot of feedback here. Okay, without comment, we will uh, do a roll call vote. Uh, Jack Eigelman? Aye. Leanna Joyner? Aye. Pat is Aye. not here yet. Joe Chesler? Aye. Uh, Elise Smart? Aye. Excellent. And I'm an eye as well. Motion carries. Next item is to review and approve the minutes from the March 22nd, 2023 meeting. Can I get a motion to approve? I'll move. Thank you, Lisa. And a second? I'll second. I'll second. Thank you, Jack. Uh, any comments or questions on the minutes? Yeah. Okay, without counter question, we'll do a roll call. Jack Eichelman? Aye. Leanna Joyner? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Joe Aye. Chesler? Uh, Elise Martyr? Aye. Aye. And I and I as well, motion carries. And a little bit of feedback issues here, but we'll work through that. 
Okay, the next item is public comment. We did receive a public comment uh, through our, the system. However, uh, it was from Patrick, but that item is coming up at our next meeting. So Jessica, just to be sure we are going to uh, reserve that comment and present it when we um, tackle that um, agenda item next month. Yes, I think that would be um, the most appropriate time to do so. Okay. Yeah, so we, we definitely have that on file and it will be part of our um, our conversation uh, next month when we discuss that item. Um, and Patrick, thank you for your comment. Uh, first item of business is the proposed right-of-way closure. Jessica. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to share a presentation here in just a second. Okay, let me make sure everybody can see it. Okay, great. So um, this is a request for a closure of um, a portion of Sunrise Drive. And this is a request that is, has been submitted by um, Mr. Mike and Emily Sewell on behalf of themselves as well as their neighbors at um, 30, 34, and 38 Sunrise Drive and um, their address is 26 Sunrise Drive. The unopened right-of-way was originally platted as Westview Place um, in 1924 and again in a, in a different plat and that was filed in 2005, but it was never accepted by the city and has never been improved and really it just serves as the driveway for these these addresses and Westview Place was never used for addressing purposes. Um, so, and as well for uh, E911 purposes. So what is being proposed is the closure of this right of way that would then be divvied up among these four properties and a new plat will be um, recorded by the applicant and it will include appropriate easements um, to be filed, including water easements and um, MSD easements as well. This is a graphic of the proposed closure area. Um, so you can see the four houses that kind of butt up right against on either side of this proposed right away that will be closed. Um, technical review committee, which is a staff internal review of multiple departments, they met on March 20th and um, recommended that this request be forwarded to the Multimodal Transportation Commission um, and approved by the Multimodal Transportation Commission. So we have a motion um, for you to consider recommending that City Council approve the requested closure of an unopened right of way adjacent to 2630, 34, and 38 Sunrise Drive. And this is scheduled to go to Council on um, May, let's see, May 23rd, with ultimately with a public hearing occurring um, June 27th, and I believe we have the applicant on the on the call today or on the meeting today. If there happen to be any questions, um, and I and I think that's it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions as well. All right, great. Thanks, Jessica. Um, are there any comments or questions on this item? Oops, I see a hand somewhere. Uh, Leanna, sorry. That's all right. Um, I'm familiar with this. It looks like a private drive. When I've passed it, it's like unmaintained. So Correct. It, it's just it just continues in that fashion. The homeowners take the responsibility of any upkeep road management, maintenance, driveway access, that kind of thing, as is currently the case. Is that the idea? Yes. Um, and actually, it'll make it even more official because what will happen is that the this orange area will be divided into pieces and then added on to the property of each of the abutting property owners so it will actually become um, part of their property 
And so it will be even more clear as to who owns it, who's responsible for it, um, and maintaining it. Hey, Jessica, I, uh, just in out there walking around, it was uh, what I was noticing is this really is the driveway. So it kind of comes in from the from what we're looking at the image from the right going to the left and it doesn't go through. And when we're cutting those pieces up, are we creating a problem in the future where um, at 26, I think, is the first or 24 is the first home? Um, and they would own the section where 26, you know, anything to the left would not have access any longer. That makes sense. Um, I'm not 100% sure if I followed, um, but this sort of triangle piece right here is 26. Okay, um, so the, the house in the uh, uh, upper right. The, yes, that one. You know, mm -hmm. So if we're cutting up this orange space to the pieces in front of the house, the house mm -hmm. all the way to the left would no longer have access technically. Is that are we creating a problem here or is that already all worked out with some kind of covenant that's gonna be created? Um, it is all worked out, so to speak. And Beautiful. everybody is maintaining access. We can't approve anything that doesn't um, provide access to a public road for each lot. So each lot is required to have access to a public roadway. Um, so that has all been um, proposed in the in the plat that will be ultimately be approved and recorded. Um, I'll see if I can pull up another graphic. Uh, and I think Mike has has joined us and has some comments. Hey, Mike, did you have any? Uh, oh, sorry, you did your hand raise. I beg your pardon. Well, I just in response to uh, your question, you asked a really good question and. Um, uh, all of the neighbors have collaborated on this project together and we all have easements. Um, that was a, a condition that um, access would be maintained uh, to the properties. That was a condition of, of, of getting this road closed and we have satisfied that condition. So every neighbor um, will have access to their property uh, in perpetuity. Perfect. Excellent. Any other comments or questions? Uh, without any comments, we can entertain a motion. Is there a motion, I'm Jessica, waiting. that you had potentially? Yes, let me um, bring that back up here. here on the screen. I'll, around a little bit. I'm, I'll make a motion to recommend that the City Council approve the requested closure of an unopened right of way adjacent to 26, 30, 34, and 38 South West Trail. Thank you, Leanna. Can I get a second? I'll second that. Matt. Thank you, Jack. Any other comments or questions? No, without comment, we'll go through a roll call vote. Uh, Jack Eggleman? Aye. Leanna Joyner? Joe Chesler? Aye. Elise Bowder? Aye. And I'm an eye as well. Motion carries. Thanks so much. Uh, and good luck. Uh, the next item that we have is uh, uh, where we uh, review and approve uh, um, input and proposed speed limit changes. Jessica. Uh, thank you. I'm actually going to pass this off to Christopher Cairns um, if he is here. He is our traffic Hi, engineer. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Jessica. As uh, Jessica said, I'm Chris Cairns, uh, city traffic engineer, and we have several uh, speed limit changes. I will pull up a presentation if I may. Just, uh, and you, you should have a link to the attachment that basically shows the same thing. I want to give you a map overall, though, the orange ones shown there, the Clingman Avenue and Sand Hill Road, those are state roads. So NCDOT has recommended those and the purple ones are the city streets. And I'll go over those individually in a moment. Uh, the, the Sand Hill Road is basically in its entirety within the city limits from uh, Bear Creek. Uh, it says Wendover, but it's Bear Creek. It's, that's 
DOT has it categorized as um, Wendover. Um, that one and Clingman Road is essentially from Patton down to across the bridge to Riverview Drive. And then I'll go through the other ones uh, in a minute. Um, sorry, not going where I want. All right, so Sand Hill Road, this was a city, I mean, a citizen request, and, and I think several requested uh, this uh, reduction in speed. They're going to change it from 35 to 30 miles per hour. And then later this year, just so you're aware, they're also going to establish a school speed limit. Uh, and I, that one, I am not sure, but I think it's 20 miles per hour. It may be 25. I'm not sure, but it is. Uh, there is a school zone within this limits as well. But this needs to happen first before that happens. And if, if you're not familiar or if I haven't explained this previously, city needs to provide concurrence first. So uh, they uh, so city council ne needs to approve this. And then it goes back to uh, NCDOT for them to finalize and implement. Uh, the city requested a reduced speed limit on Klingman. A lot of bicycle and pedestrian activity along Klingman. And uh, they were open to 25 miles per hour uh, and uh, have so recommended. So that was really good news. Uh, I, I know there have been some pushes for 20 miles per hour. That is rare that they will go for 20 miles per hour. So 25 is what uh, we were able to get at this time. And that will encompass, when I mentioned to the south, by the bridge, there's a, a, a cross, a rail crossing, we'll call it, but it's a, it's a pedestrian crossing at that, at the basically at the limit of that. Uh, so it will be within the 25 miles per hour that crosswalk will. And then the last one there I did not mention earlier, but it's just uh, to document something that's already in the field. Our, our records right now have Meadow Road as 45 miles per hour. And for some reason it got changed and not uh, documented. So DOT brought that up and asked us to document it instead of going back to 45. So uh, that one's just a, a, a paperwork exercise more or less. On the city streets, Hampton Road is over in uh, Beverly Hills area. Uh, it's one of several that's not in our code at this time. So by default, it would be 35. And uh, the, the, for consistency in the neighborhood, there's there's variety, variety of speed limits, but mostly our residential is uh, 25 miles per hour. So that is what Hampton Road recommendation is. Also another uh, residential is East Street between uh, Thompson and Fairview. That one is a little bit tighter and has some really unusual uh, geometry and uh, we recommend 20 miles per hour for, for East Street. And finally, Wells Avenue, that's next to the church and the market and the school. A lot happens on this very uh, small road. Uh, we, we were requested to do traffic calming, but with no speed limit, that really is not an option. So our first step is to uh, tell people what speed they should be going. And 15 is reasonable for this. Uh, basically, it splits parking areas with a, a lot of activity. Buses go through there, but there's just there's school children, there's church activity, and of course the Tuesday market. So, uh, 15 miles per hour is what we recommend for that. And that is all. And I'd be glad to discuss any of these if, if you would like. Thanks, Chris. Jack. Uh, Yeah, hey Chris. Um, I had some questions about the Sand Hill Road. I wanted to dig into that one just a little bit more. Um, you mentioned the. I, I want how big would the school um, speed limit section be, and why thirty rather than twenty five on Sand Hill Road? My having you know, I live near there, so I know it well. But it seems like um a particularly dangerous stretch of road so i wonder if you can explain a little bit more about the constraints around changing the speed limit there uh i advocate for going a little bit further i will give you what i i know about it uh, this was a, a city i mean i'm sorry an ncdot study um and i i have not seen that study i know how they do studies though and they primarily based on context, similar roads and 85th percentile speeds. And um, 
my guess is their uh, 85th percentile speeds are would not support 25 miles per hour. I, I have not had this discussion. This one was uh, actually a bit of a surprise for me um, that it came up because it, it, I had requested the Klingman one through uh, the uh, division traffic engineer and this one came up from just from other citizens along the corridor. And they, uh, the school speed limit is for the Lucy Herring School. Um, the limits of that, I think, are just going to be near the crossing at Harnett. Uh, I don't know how many hundred feet, hundreds of feet that is, but that it's not going to be something that's like a half mile long or anything. It's usually you know, a confined distance so to get people focused on the crossing. But I, I can find, I can get information and get it back to you, but I really do did not delve into what their details were. I, I, I did see it as a positive step toward 30 miles per hour on the, on the state road, um, especially one of this length. Um, yeah. it, it's are, are there any other possible, realize it's a state road, are there any possibilities of looking at some traffic calming, um, you know, possibly removing the middle line. Um, I do have some concerns about, especially the way this road is set up and the speed that people go, it's, uh, you know, I sure. think it creates an extra danger with dropping down in the school zone and the visibility on this road. There are just a lot of issues with it. So, I'm encouraged that it's dropping down to 30 potentially, but I think this is uh, probably needs a little more review and context to make it safe. There's just huge potential here for um, yeah, yeah, I, safety concerns. We, we have limited uh, um, authority when it comes to this, but I can answer your questions and suggestions. The, the, the center line, uh, I don't know off the top of my head what the traffic volumes are, but once you get above 6,000 vehicles per day, it's actually required. So, and I think DOT has some other requirements in uh, North Carolina statutes that uh, would require the double yellow. Uh, so I understand that. And I also know that the uh, traffic calming, traditional traffic calming like speed humps or speed cushions would not be considered here. They only do those on subdivision type streets. One thing that I can offer is, uh, is uh, we have radar feedback signs and we can do a periodic. And we have the, we, we rotate uh, right now, it's four signs throughout the entire city. So we can we only do like two weeks at a time, but we can definitely uh, schedule a rotation of where it tells you your speed is type sign on Sand Hill. So, but for traffic calming itself, I, I, that would not be something, and that's something I've, talked about at length with the uh, division traffic engineer and, and I've, she's shared with me their guidance and their requirements and their, the statutory uh, reasons behind some of that. So I hope that answers your, your question. Yeah, it does. I'll yield the floor. It looks like Elizabeth, Elizabeth has got a question. Hey, Elizabeth. Yes, um, normally when we have these lane closures and speed limit things, I don't have much to add because I don't know all the streets, but for some reason, three of these five that I have lived on or around the corner from, um, and I used to live down the street from Jack. So the one thing I was gonna say about the Sand Hill one is that crosswalk below the hill on Harnett from Lucy Herring, at the very least having something uh like you know the that shows your speed limit there if if it's if we're limited by what the state road what the dot will do um having had kids that went there and knew the people that used to help the kids across the street who, have, who are no longer with us um and i don't really know that there's a lot of slowdown on that road at that intersection because it's just so hidden so that's another concern just for the just for the part in the school district um, and the other end of that the hominy creek greenway has gotten so much more popular and so much more use, but there's still not very large parking lots. And around those two areas on either, well, I guess it's the one end, uh, not off Shelburne, but the, on the far end, um, I wonder if there's something, there's, you know, people stopping, pulling out, trying to pull in a parking lot, people biking around there, getting on the greenway, if there's a possibility of something at that s section too, at that point on Sand Hill. 
One thing I'll say about the school zone, there will be school markings on the pavement. And then uh, of course there'll be uh, the signs that go with that and uh, time, I, I assume it'll be time-based uh, on the signs instead of flashers. Flashers may be something for the future, but that yeah. I, I agree that will be a, a positive step. And the more we can make that uh, school crossing uh, mm -hmm. better than it is today will be, uh, will be great. And, I, and I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't know the details enough of what I could even offer near the trail, the Greenway. But th that's something I can look at. Okay. Um, and as far as East Street, I travel down that one every day. I live around one house away from East Street, and I'm really glad that that is being moved to 20 because that's all the GPS is now taking people down East Street to get to Thompson. Um, I have just heard from some uh, someone in our Oakley Neighborhood Association, however, that they were going to put this, the city was going to come put in sidewalks on East Street, which I had not heard before from any of the committees that I'm on. So didn't know if that was part of this or something else. And if it's not. Uh, really I'm not familiar with that either. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I, I did not know that. I had not heard that. Mm -hmm. This is uh, totally separate. Okay. And then the last one, the comment I have, I lived on Hampton Road <laughs> before I lived down the street from Jack. And that is a very curvy, hilly road. Um, I was actually surprised to see 25. I thought that would be lowered to 20 because I, I can't imagine someone driving down that going 25 safely um, just because there are some that are really curvy in Beverly Hills and some that are not so curvy. But this one in particular is narrow, curvy, hilly, um, and, and people I, are driving consistent with what you're saying. They, they are going in the 20 to 25 range from mm -hmm. what we measured. Okay. So when you mentioned the 85th percentile, they put it at 25 because that's still within that range. Is that? It is in that range. And that, and, and we use other things that we use a thing called us limits that tries to weigh in the context and the, the nature of things, how many driveways, what's the crash history, things like that. And we compare, our own take on the context and the speeds and the, this U.S. limits and uh, come up with a recommendation. And, and 25 was what we had recommended and it was consistent with that U.S. limits, which is uh, uh, actually a U.S. DOT mm. developed product. Okay. Thank you. Joe? Hey, Chris. Um, thanks for putting all this together. I mean, I, obviously, I think all of these are great. Um, not to harp on <laughs> Sand Hill anymore. I think you answered most everything, and, and both Jack and Elizabeth brought up my initial questions. Um, I wondered, though, speaking specifically to that school zone crossing, if something like a Hawk Beacon or perhaps even a more, I, I will, I will say lightly raised crosswalk or some kind of more tactile for vehicle crosswalk might be something dot could look at for that just to really heighten that crosswalk and then again maybe something similar down there at the greenway um i, I yeah i would just agree with with basically what jack and elizabeth have said that's a that's a pretty curvy road and i feel like it's the nature of it context has changed there's a lot of driveways off of it now that 15 years ago, we're not there. So it seems like it, this is a good step in the right direction, but probably needs even more. Jack? Thank you, Joe. And I, I will I will talk with DOT about the design of their, uh, I know they have a standard design of school, school reduced speed school zones, but I also know that field adjustments can be made for things like the horizontal geometry and other site distance constraints. Yeah, and thanks, Chris, as well, for the work on this. Again, sorry to keep drilling on Sand Hill Road, but I wonder if speed tables are something that can be looked at. So I'd love to hear back on using maybe speed tables to slow people down. And I, um, I will yeah, ask just, DOT, but I'm pretty sure that that would be fall under their traffic calming interpretation. Uh, they, I, I know they don't reduce speed as much as speed humps, but they, they do have that effect. And, um, and that's something we would also have to look at internally because it does affect uh, fire response times. Yeah, I'd love it if we could look at speed tables and 
Yeah, just to second on the Hominy Creek Greenway as a trustee of the Greenway, we're doing some, we will be doing some significant work uh, at the trailhead at Sand Hill and expect more volume. And th that's just such a dangerous area for cyclists turning, uh, particularly cyclists coming downhill on Sand Hill Road and then turning uh, across the lane into the Greenway trailhead. So if you're traveling southwest bound, um, the visibility for cars and bikes are really significant. So I think as we see increased traffic volume on the Hominy Creek Greenway, that's a real danger point. So I think there needs to be just really, you know, uh, close scrutiny of Sand Hill Road. Um, and I also wonder, my last comment, and then I'll, I'll leave this um, be is whether this is consistent with recommended, what's recommended in the city's close the gap plan. And maybe that provides some insight for the future of Sand Hill Road. Jack, are you asking if the speed limit is consistent with get close the gap? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I don't, I, I see it as not inconsistent. I mean, 30 miles per hour is not great for uh, uh, cycling and walking, but it, it is a, a drop in speed limit. So it, it, it is a step, I'll just say. Um, it, it is, it's not incompatible. 30, if, if people adhere to 30, I think it would be fully compatible. But uh, I think that's a, ch a challenge that we will continue to uh, take on. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Sure. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, well, we had a, uh, would anyone care to make a recommend a uh, motion? This is informational. Jessica, do you need one? I'm sorry. Uh, right, it's just informational. Gotcha. Perfect. Well, great, Chris, thank you very much. Good info. Thank you. I think we're heading in the right direction. You know, dropping those numbers down is always good. Okay, um, moving on to unfinished business. The first item is the proposed NCDOT Sand Hill Sardis intersection improvement. Good, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Ken Putnam and I'll uh, be presenting this one. I have to apologize to start with. I'm at my desk at, at City Hall and for some reason my camera decided not to work anymore. So I uh, have to just talk to you if that's okay. Uh, we talked about this item last month and you all had some very legitimate concerns about the actual drawing that was uh, uh, provided. And uh, so the DOT has now furnished an additional drawing that has more detail as far as the um, the wits and, and, and those kinds of things. And then I think if I remember correctly, there was another question. Uh, I think in general, everyone liked the idea that there would be pedestrian signals added to this uh, intersection um, as well as a crosswalk. And then there were some questions about how far did the sidewalk go? So at the drawing that you're looking at on the bottom, you know, it's on the bottom there, that sidewalk right there actually goes a good ways. It goes all the way to Lake Drive in the Inca area. It cross at the next intersection up, the next signalized intersection up as you go towards uh, Smoky Park Highway, it crosses the road uh, there, but it does go all the way. So there is a good solid connection. Now, on this drawing where it comes across and ties into the corner there, you know, there's some commercial establish establishments there and the sidewalk only goes to the extent of where those businesses end. So with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions that are still uh, out there. And again, the purpose of this is the DOT is seeking uh, council support for them to move forward with this project. And so obviously 
uh, that would be the action that we would ask you to take that it move forward to council. Oops. Thank you, Ken. Uh, any comments or questions? Well, I know this is a great deal more um, information than what we had. I think one of the concerns was the, the, the speed of folks coming to make that turn where that crosswalk is. So I think it's a little, it's much clearer now. Um, you know, there still could be some obviously speed sight line, you know, conflicts there, but we have to get people across a busy road. And sometimes, you know, I think those exist. Uh, Leanne? Leanne? I, I apologize. I wasn't here um, last time this was discussed, but the, I guess thinking about, um, you know, bicycle safety and, and connectivity, it, what implications do these changes have for um, bike safety improvements, if at all, um, or can we anticipate any kind of um, negative consequences from these changes in that regard? I think uh, as far as, oh, and um, Leanna, just to give you the overall scope of the project, as you can see right here, uh, there's a through and a, and a right turn it's done at the same lane and based on the, the crash history that's existing out there the dot is moving forward with the project to create a small right turn lane separate from the through lane that's the gist of it and then to add the pedestrian thing so as far as adding anything for bicycles it's not included in this project It is going to be a signal pedestrian crosswalk north to south, correct? Yes, that's correct. That's okay. correct. So we, we can have bikers and other folks using that cross that way to get, get across um, as a signal too. Right. Okay. Any other, uh, Joe? Sorry about that. Last minute. Um, Ken, it looks like they're actually, the proposal is to pull that sidewalk back away from the corner as opposed to the way it is now. Am I reading that correctly? Oh, yes, it will. It will will be relocated to kind of accommodate that right turn slip lane. But it'll still be back of the curb when it's when it's finished. OK, so they're actually so part of that actually then is that's what I'm trying to read this drawing a little bit better. Uh huh. I see the where the slip. Okay, so they're basically going to come in and they don't really show necessarily that slip lane being drawn in there, do they? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, you can see you see the one where right there in the middle it shows the the, the left turning pocket right there, yep. and then you can see where the the through lane is. It's still got the markings in it, but right to the right of that is the actual lane. And you, if we zoomed in on that picture, you could see the pavement width of it right. Or the lane width of it right there um uh there it showed right there i think it's an 11 foot lane but that it. it actually shows there but the pavement markings haven't really been changed yeah then that's what i was kind of looking for i was looking yeah. for that right turn you know drawing in there i wasn't seeing that so and, and they still got the existing curb and gutter in there the way it is yeah all right thanks ken sure thing joe Jack? Just wondering if we're leaving anything on the table to, you know, the point of connectivity and pedestrians and cycling, like I don't have a good vision necessarily. I don't have a good engineering uh, lens, but I wonder if there's anything else that, you know, would be low hanging fruit that would make this even safer for pedestrians and cyclists. I don't know what that, you know, I'm not, I know this is a just a tricky junction. So yeah, I wonder if anyone has any input of what might strengthen this that we could ask the state. Yeah, Jack, I, I, I take your point. I mean, I feel like what I'm seeing is it's a, uh, it's, you know, it's not a great place right now. And I feel like this is a, a vast improvement because at least pedestrians know where they're supposed to go, where the best possible sight lines are, and the you know the protected crossings are. Um, you know, I agree with you. There's it's it's a very dangerous situation. You have this you know you have speeds and sight lines and turns and 
you know, uh, turn lanes. So there's, I think there's a lot involved, but I do feel like this action is uh, a pretty substantial improvement over what we're dealing with, what folks have to deal with now. Uh, any other comments or questions? Okay, without, oh, somebody? Uh, can I get a motion? Anyone interested in making a motion? Uh, this is Joe, Joe Chesler. I'll uh, move approval. All right, so Joe uh, proposes the motion as presented. Uh, can I get a second? I'll second. Leanne, a second. Excellent. Um, without further comment or question, we will have a roll call vote. Uh, Jack Ackerman? Aye. Leanna Joyner? Aye. Joe Chesler? Aye. Elise Mauter? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this will go to the uh, May 23rd City Council meeting, just so you'll know that. All right, great. Thank you, Ken. Sure thing. Okay, the next item is the presentation on the proposed Aspire Development Project. Aspire. Uh, project Aspire development project. I'll just go ahead and do a little bit of a intro prior to uh, the applicant uh, giving the presentation. So this is a little little bit out of the norm for us to have a um, proposed development project come before the Multimodal Transportation Commission, um, but we've talked a little bit about it, um, particularly because it is such a large um, portion of our downtown and could have a very or will have a, an impact on on downtown transportation um, and uh, Joe has been as part of the PNZ um, also recommended that we have this come before us just for discussion and I believe the applicant is attending the the design commission or design committee in a week or so and so they were very interested in having the multimodal commission take a look at the project as proposed so they could get some feedback early feedback from this body um, and i believe we have a member of the of the applicant team here and i will go ahead and turn it over to them and um, if you need me to run your presentation i'm happy to do so otherwise you can um, share it through the the virtual meeting Thank you, Jessica. Yes, this is uh, Robert Poppleton. I am with the development team with Furman Company. Um, we actually have five members of, of our team on the call today. Um, I'm joined by our um, design lead, Dave Crabtree, as well as our civil engineer, um, John Connolly, and Paul Vest of the YMCA and Scott Hughes of First Baptist Church of Asheville. So I wanna thank you all for this platform uh, and the opportunity to engage with this um, with this group, we we are eager for your feedback. We are uh, we know that the the sh perhaps some of you are familiar with the project effort. If not, we hope to uh, share more with you today. Um, but given the scale of our project, we we are um, in a, in addition to many things and seeing it succeed, we also want to get it right for the community. Um, we know it's in a very strategic location, highly visible, but also in terms of connectivity, um, it is full of potential for improving um, several ways of access into and around the um, CBD. So um, I, I, maybe by, I have several people's video on, but maybe by way of nodding, are, are people, uh, generally familiar with Project Aspire or were, were um, provided material and they've been able to reference before? Okay, um, excellent. Um, so I, I will um, hear just shortly, Dave, um, if you want to start trying to, okay, excellent. Thank you um, for confirming that you've seen the slide deck. Um, I'll have Dave Crabtree 
start sharing his screen. Dave, if you want to walk us through some of the model, and, and while you're doing that, I will um, provide very brief commentary on um, you know what we're what we've been doing in the last um, almost nearing a couple of years, more intensely in the last year, uh, studying this project master plan. Um, we've uh, Furman has been brought in through by the Y and by the church, uh, First Baptist Church of Asheville to help facilitate this, this vision that is really um, audacious as uh, Pastor Mack at uh, the church likes to describe it. Um, it's truly mixed use over 10 acres and uh, w with everything from a variety of housing, avail uh, housing products to a hotel, to a brand new YMCA state of the art um, multiple uh, parking garages um, and frontage on a handful of, of different streets in the interstate. Um, so we, we, after much community engagement, um, we, we've now started our conditional zoning process. Um, so Dave, are, are you able to uh, share the, the model? What we, we've found helpful um, following the direction um, suggestion from past committees is that we actually have our live model to, to help uh, per, to gain additional perspective. Um, so really uh, today we're, we're happy to get as detailed into the project as is helpful uh, to answer questions, to really start a dialogue um, and hopefully seek your feedback in order to enhance our project even at the master plan concept level. We, we, we're, we're being thoughtful about um, how we can improve transportation, multimodal connections, and um, pedestrian, uh, create new pedestrian environments. So, Dave, passing to you. Oh, you're on mute, sir. There you go. Uh, I was hitting the unmute button, but it wasn't unmuting. It was probably the most amazing thing I've ever said. And and uh, but uh, with your thoughts too, Robert. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Would we like to do a, a quick PDF run through of just where what materials have been presented and where we are, and then culminate with the model fly through? Um, that that may have. I, I see your mute, muted voice giving uh, <laughs> verbal affirmation. Um, so uh, thank you all. Again, my name's Dave uh, uh, Crabtree. I will uh, see if I can get back to the beginning of this thing. Um, what you are seeing is what's going to be uh, resubmitted here to the DRC and uh, well, on the 28th, in the next couple of days. Uh, it is a working draft, so you might find some omissions and things that are still in progress. Um, and as Robert noted, this has been a, a very participatory, in-depth process over a, a couple of years or, or more, really, for the Y and the church. They've been looking and considering this property for a number of years. Um, so multiple vision sessions, engaged workshops, uh, model building, you know, folks designing their own future. Uh, build, you know, we brought in model pieces for folks to actually build a master plan on their own. And these are actually some of the things that people were building. Um, I'm we sorry, did have Dave. Can I interrupt just for a second? Is everyone yes. else seeing his shared screen? Okay, I don't see anything. If you're sharing, are you sharing anything, Dave? I am sharing. Okay, I don't see anything. Just, just, yeah, just I'll see. I said maybe. Uh, all right, let me reshare again. One second. I'll say it says I'm sharing, but maybe it just clicked off. There you go. It seems to be going on. Ah, right, cool. Uh, apologize for that. All right, cool. So, uh, very quickly, we can get to where we were. Um, everybody's seeing screens now, and again, multiple years of process and what that might look like. Through, I, I'm sure you all have been involved in workshop style charrettes, multi days, and many periods of time uh, over the last several uh, years, including model building hands-on workshop. These aren't from the architects in our team. This is actually from uh, folks in, you know, in the workshop from both the church and the Y. 
And some of the things I always think is important is the vision and values that we try to draw out, living stones, beautiful belonging, serving the next generation, healing, uh, ecumenical benefit, that idea of the blended benefit of both private and, and public and spiritual uh, uses. Um, we turned and, and did sort of uh, visual listening and walking of the city, to, you know, what makes it special. And I, everybody's aware of this, right? The, the alleys and the vistas, the corners, you know, the little moments that happen throughout Asheville, um, the granular scale, you know, the idea of nature and topography, it's always, you know, sort of um, present for sure craft and texture and even the the very i, I think um a wonderful skyline you know that has moments and peaks that sort of uh, poke through uh the urban fabric and identify um it created a very nice and elegant skyline so how do we take those things in consideration along with uh you know zoning requirements and all this and i'm trying to flip through this quickly just so you get a sense and not go in great depth um but what that started us is creating this idea of a city uh, in nature and sort of celebrating topography. We've got, you know, 40 to 50 feet of elevation uh, between the, this, my, can you see my cursor? Let me use my little hand. Um, so pretty significant. You got about uh, 16 foot between here and here. So also moderate. Um, that is sort of sets the way for the various gateways along Central and, and on College and Charlotte. And we recognize um, the importance of those as people are sort of emerging into the city fabric. Views and vistas, particularly of the dome. And so we've paid great deal of attention and you'll notice even carving away buildings and sort of uh, spilling out green space from the steps of, of the church to kind of celebrate the visual identity of the um, of the steeple and from multiple vantage points, whether you're a person on the street or to, you know, on I-240. And then one of the kind of important pieces was what we called sort of the mountain in the valley, essentially framing and scaling down sort of development as it approaches the church. Um, and so that was the sort of almost a, a, a very specific design driver throughout the process recognizing that technically we could build 265 foot um you know for in these blue zones here and then 145 foot anywhere around the church um we've kind of stepped that and left any sort of taller buildings as these sort of in the gateway zones if you will um and bookending the development while still breaking down those massing and tearing those down um, the 145 foot zone, and then really what we call the church, the dome zone, where we try to keep things stepping down to another level. Um, and, you know, again, phase one, generically phase two, there could be sub phases within there. Um, but what we're looking at is sort of hotel, uh, mixed use residential office, YMCA office, mixed use residential, and then residential. The parking is being integrated. Um, and, you know, we're doing our, our, our best to be granular as much as possible uh, while also um, meeting the needs of what current building uh, sizes need for floor plates and, you know, uh, usable areas and so on and so forth. So what that master plan, you know, again, is here is uh, Charlotte, here is College, Oak and Woodfin, uh, Central. Um, we have access points. Um, through uh, at the right here at the gateway coming underneath the, the bridge. Uh, we've tried to keep parking uh, both on street. Uh, we've maintained all the sidewalk and buffers around sort of Woodfin, um, but we've also maintained parking on site to these two locations to kind of distribute them and sort of anchor them and then shroud them in, in um, you know, building development so that you're just not looking at giant uh, parking decks. So you do have sort of liner space wrapping around um, in, in other treatments. We have access points coming through here, coming through here, and then we have the interior vias, and again, sort of interior vias here. These are all sort of private streets, if you will. Um, we have an interior uh, private street here as well. Some of the um, considerations again were you know the green space would be active it's shown as just green at this point but these would be sort of active places for pedestrian 
uh, activities, bicycles, people walking, you know, multimodal, since we're in a multimodal mode here, um, there would be access to all of those um, modes of transportation. Um, there is through drive capacity in these uh, parking garages. So the idea that you can come in and through and ramp through and then circulate up in into, and again, that's a 50 foot uh, chain. So it's not like a direct route and similar about a 16 foot change here, but there is ingress egress into the garage. We've maintained the distances from the drive here and then also balancing the distance from uh, the large curve here at college um, in Charlotte. Um, to try to be a little bit more technical, we have maintained buffers along the perimeter and added, you know, sidewalks all around the perimeter of these guys and maintaining existing trees. That'll show up in some later uh, exhibits. We've So as I come through here, um, again, hotel, well, just to, to ground everybody, um, you got college and central intersection, Oak and Woodfin, you know, church here. What we've tried to do, because this is master planning and only going for bulk area and density, we're showing kind and quality of buildings through precedent imagery that, you know, all of these buildings would take on much more character than the colored masses that they are, both at the street level as well as as they touch, touch the sky. Again, here, and the, the parking deck and the treatments of liner space along its perimeter, it, it um, Central and college. There's been a lot of discussion, or well, I say a lot, but there was a lot of discussion in some of the past meetings, you know, around what's capable to be done here with state right of ways and things like that. Um, and this this sort of intersection being large and sweeping, um, and those are sort of outside of our direct control, but might come up. I, I'm imagining again in this this um, venue. Again, some of the view vistas where we're sort of maintaining the. Um, the dome of the church, drop off for hotel in, in this sort of interior via here, YMCA is in green, um, the church. This is sitting just at the, the, the um, right where the Oak and Woodfin bend. We've called this Fellowship Way, although it is, will not be allowed to be called Fellowship Way. Uh, it's a symbolic name at this point, just due to the naming uh, needs within the, the city. Uh, this would be an all of the landscape has been purposely left out of these models so that you're seeing massing and intent versus the more urban design quality that this would have with active streets and, you know, zero curb. The idea for this is was more of a festival street style, as you see in the imagery here with, you know, lighting and sort of pavers and things like that, seating along the perimeter edge. Um, so again, the models are generic because the goal here is massing in bulk and area um, in broader intent for master planning. Um, we will be coming back by phase for individual design that ensures like the ground floors and all of that are meeting transparency codes and uh, retail pedestrian activation guidelines, so on and so forth. Little things like that pertain to this, like we have maintained um, stepping back the massing here to maintain view triangles, for example. So where some of the, um, that helps both design, but it's also getting into sort of view triangles. At the major corners where we've had the taller buildings, we have also tried to pull those back and create more of a pedestrian sort of uh, courtyard corner, if you will, and make some relief since the buildings are a bit taller. Dave, if I may just jump in yeah. real quick. Um, if there are members on this call who have been tracking this project, or even if you were paying attention during the last two slides, um, you may have picked up, we have um, an option, uh, some optionality that we've built into this model for phase one. Um, just to, to speak about that, this is part of the iterative process we're going through as a progression through the planning and zoning, we've, we've been uh, refining the model. Um, and so this specifically on phase one, what's shown currently, uh, we know cert we know that the, the, the hotel on the side program will remain. We know that the YMCA program will remain in green. Um, we are solving for the right market um, product for 
the in between those spaces. So in orange, you're seeing what what, what is being um, programmed as residential, and when in the next slide or um, it is shown in blue, the same or the next two slides. There you go. Uh, blue is showing office. Um, we are very confident that the, that Asheville needs um, Class A office uh, product, but um, in today's market conditions, it's been we haven't been able to um, have the expression to justify that large of an office delivery uh, in phase one. Um, so we are holding the the flexibility within our application for conditional zoning to support both or to support office or residential in phase one or both some mixture um, thereof so just wanted to let you know that um we're that that's we've done this on purpose uh as you're tracking some of these images yeah that's a really good point um I would also know part of this is if we went resi, it would actually have a more limited uh, parking need. However, we're maintaining the same parking regardless. We are utilizing a shared parking strategy and we're identifying the only building that requires parking to be calculated is the hotel, but we have nearly 17 to 1800 spaces on, on site in the parking decks. We are making an effort to go in, in ground you know, again, in the future, should we find some issues of under underground fissures with water that can't be remediated, maybe we lose a level. But the idea is we are going and using the grade, so we're not going up as high with, with parking. Um, and the idea is we've parked based on the, the urban code, um, even though it's not really required here, because we're sort of serving as a hub that people wouldn't just park here. I could imagine people parking here, enjoying a restaurant, enjoying a, a visit to a friend, a visit to the church and to the Y, and then meandering uh, throughout their day to the city and finding other things to do because it does have access uh, there to, to um, 240 and very walkable to the rest of the city. Um, all that data, and I'll flip back here, and how we're currently parking and so on and so forth is noted by phase and by building here. Um, so it's, um, one way we make our parking count really small is just make the text really small, right? But certainly we're around 1,850 spaces, depending on um, some other factors. And uh, roughly between um, if 20% shared, uh, and again, we are maintaining um, the parallel parking uh, where all ever possible because we, we believe in the parallel parking is creating a better uh, sidewalk experience. Uh, we do note that there's existing uh, bike in integrated bike lanes, not separate five foot wide segregated, but I call it integrated bike lanes along Oak and Woodfin. So we'd assume the city would continue to uh, to want those things uh, along some of these uh, current right of ways. Let me go back to where I was. So again, here. Um, some of the section details that we're just kind of, a lot of this was important to the church, particularly here, so that we have the, some sidewalk, uh, paver-like streets with zero curb. And while again, they'll be much more illustrative than this, um, this is kind of take, stripping away a lot of the niceties just to kind of show the sort of right of way um, wh where people are coming through. Again, this would be a private street. We've affectionately called Fellowship Way uh, Church to our left, YMCA to our right. This is looking down, uh, you know, um, a long fellowship way coming just off of 240 and into the city. And then you would uh, be able to turn in here if you were visiting the site. Further down the way is a large sweeping turn at Charlotte and College um, and then access to the parking garage spaced appropriately from the previous um, previous inlet. An internal street that we have the sort of interior via let me, I'll, I'll flip back really quickly because I we know this site well and you guys are being familiar with it. This idea, it could be pedestrian sometimes, uh, uh, vehicles not on the street here. Um, it's essentially um, a, a very um, um, sort of comfortable space. Let me show you where that is in plan. So that view is sitting here, looking up the hill 
um, into uh, in towards the church, right? You can imagine it is much wider than uh, Wall Street it, there in town. Um, this is approximately a 75 foot right away. So still pretty significant uh, in terms of width and ability to have, uh, you know, traffic lanes and uh, parallel parking, adequate sidewalks, so on and so forth um, in this area here. This is sitting at the footsteps of the church, kind of hovering just off of 240, looking down into what would be green space and public park area, some passive, active, so on and so forth. And again, we're utilizing um, sample imagery to suggest what these would come because these each even this little small little pocket park will be a project in itself. Um, so, you know, we do perceive many participants in this project as it moves along uh, to create this tapestry of urban experience here. Now, again, you see our notes to ourselves, um, but some of long I-240 um, staring down, tearing down the massing is per some previous requests. Um, and then as the gateway is coming in there um, along the, the way there. So future design considerations uh, at phase one being the most um, forward uh, coming forward here, um, you know, just urban design illustrious. That's not a final design. This gives you a sense of what happens when you go from, you know, colored mass to some level of street trees and dangly lights coming across. And, you know, these are obviously just sketches, uh, but giving that urban character of walkability and so on and so forth is what we would anticipate. And that pretty much concludes, um, you know, the presentation of where the, the current master planning is. And happy to answer any questions. And um, I, did I, is that a, a hand showing up? I'm not sure. Let me see here. Um, yeah, uh, Maggie? Hey, folks. Um, I'm Maggie. I'm the city council liaison, and I've gotten to hear about your project a couple different times now at community events and actually chat with some of you in the past. And I just want to express gratitude that you're spending some time coming to this multimodal commission. I know that's not a standard practice or requirement in the development review process, but it shows your commitment to the community and your openness to learn and listen, which is been what I've experienced every intersection point with y'all. This project is massive, y'all. This is a really potentially downtown transforming scale. And the fact that it's being pursued with mission of the two nonprofits at the heart and with a developer team that, although from the private sector, which we often like to you know, point fingers to developers. I think that y'all are really showing up with your mission partners in good faith and, and taking it slow and steady. So there's a million details to figure out before anyone steps foot in any of those potential sites. Um, but I just am really grateful of the leadership of saying, you know what, we want to talk to the Multimodal Commission because we understand that how people get to and from where they're going is part of building community and, and, and building our city. So just thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Robert and I are big fans of the of a recent uh, of uh, urban design mission. And I think the world of development projects move at the speed of the trust. <laughs> so and uh, that was uh, a great Urban Land Institute uh, conference we were at. So um, thank you, Maggie. Uh, Jack? Yeah, just to second a couple of things that Maggie said is um, I love to see the city going up personally and uh, to see it done, the skyline uh, be done thoughtfully, although that's not our domain here, I guess. <laughs> we go, but um, I just had a couple points that I want to make, and I know this is early in the design stage, but would love to see within the design, uh, you know, all sorts of cool possibilities for bike infrastructure. Um, uh, definitely bike parking. Um, I would love to see that not fall on the city to do. I'd love to see that in the development. I'd love to be able to make sure that cyclists can cut through this um, in a safe way. Um, 
uh, you know, uh, building tunnels under the bridges or under the uh, under the bridges under the buildings could be cool. Um, but there's just some great bike infrastructure, shelters, tying it into bike parking and and uh, the delivery of uh, buses. And I just think there can be some really cool opportunities there and don't want to miss those at all. So I hope you'll continue to consult with us and then, you know, the rest of the community. And then just finally, I think, you know, the um, what's the project um uh uh on the on, on college avenue the bike lanes like the possibilities of really connecting all the way through downtown with thoughtful pedestrian stuff so my one of my big worries are the edges of this development whether that be on the development property or on the city property and i'd love for us to really have an opportunity to uh design that thoughtfully and it could just be an amazing, amazing addition. So, you know, I feel uh, optimistic about what's here um, ahead. So thank you all. Yeah, we really like the idea that Central, particularly coming under I-240, connecting into the neighborhood there as a sort of gateway. And that could be an interesting, um, you know, it's, bridge beautification underneath there is outside of the our sort of direct abilities that none of us can go out there and just start painting the bridge uh, without getting in a bunch of trouble um but little fun uh, lighter quicker cheaper place making things that can happen around the site a lot of times we look at these projects and these are hundreds of millions of dollars versus you know the more community grassroots um you know guerrilla urbanism that could happen um that balanced with i think you were bringing up you know it both college um and um in charlotte um some of the the challenges there was some good conversation brought up of is there a potential you know we want charlotte to become a more active street um but that's going to take beyond i think all of this on the on the call here um and is there a future potential what we've done is provide you know better sidewalks and more streetscaping and so on and so forth um, and also putting sort of a landscape buffer towards um, the street's edge I, I, if um, right now the sidewalk is a little little small thing and it's butted directly against the the traffic and and that's you know currently a pretty busy street so that's been a, a conversation um, you know does does Charlotte become a road on a diet at some point um, But we do have talking about Charlotte. Um, just one thing that's not yet in our uh, our program, but that we're currently looking at with First Baptist Church is um, seeing if there's an activation opportunity with what's today a fire lane for them um, between the church and the interstate, and just as another way to to connect with the master plan and with downtown beyond that. Um, yeah, that's that plan view is probably better to easier way to see it. Um, so that that is something that we hope to show in future um, future versions of this plan, just another connection point um, so that we can while, especially while we're waiting on Charlotte to improve in, in, in some future time. Um, other ways to increase safety for pedestrian um, and bike traffic. Yeah, and actually this uh, currently has a little uh, spur that does mm -hmm. that. There is a fire lane that goes back there. Um, we do imagine, you know, why these are sort of private streets, they are treated as public vias, you know, they're private because they're on private property but that's not the intent. Um, so, you know, we do imagine um, and would be having sort of bicycle uh, parking and throughout, you know, at, at various nodes um, throughout the development. Um, obviously the YMCA has the, a vested interest in, in that sort of thing as well, as well as the church. I mean, not everybody drives to church. Some folks walk, some, some folks might um, also ride a bike. And you and guys I'll, are- I'll plug, I'll, I'll plug a, um, a, a future program 
that is intended for what's the ground level of building five. In addition to contributions to affordable housing, um, you know, housing in general, like I mentioned in the onset, we'll have some market rate product. We're really optimistic about a workforce product being part of building one. Um, and that would be in phase one. That's a new conversation for the project. You know, if we don't have the office concept as heavy as it, it was once intended, um, we see that being replaced with workforce. And when I say workforce, anywhere between 80% AMI to 120% AMI, but uh, with, with focus for more market rate, true market products on, on phase two, as well as a light tech um, or deep, more deeply affordable product in phase two. But that building five that I mentioned has a ground floor that's commercial space that's intended for affordable commercial. Um, so not, so also contributing to the small business community and uh, to people who wouldn't otherwise have access to commercial space downtown. Um, there may, maybe there's something that we can work into that program. And this is more thoughts for, for you all um, if you're connected with to a bike hub or, you know, some bike shop that can service um, this area of downtown. Um, you know, so the, what those levels of affordability are yet are to be determined, but, you know, we've done a lot of as on the development side projects with new market tax credits. We've done projects with in partnership with corporate sponsors to make things affordable. So there are several ways to, to achieve affordable commercial space. Just thought I'd put that out for you guys to chew on um, for future conversations. Thank you. Uh, Leanna? Thanks. I got. I have a couple questions. Um, just seeking a little bit of clarity. So I heard you mention uh, Pocket Park. That's at the church and adjacent to the church, but um, private most, in its function. Is that accurate? I'm. I'm sorry. The question was Pocket Parks at the church and adjacent to the church. Yeah, I'm asking. I'm asking if the Pocket Park that you mentioned is there adjacent to the church. And then it's it's a privately held park, or it it's it's publicly available but privately held and managed. I'm speaking a little out of turn here, but you know this is all private land essentially from anywhere in in these bounds here. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't be publicly accessed. The spirit of the development has been while these are interior uh, vias are sort of private roads. Um, they are intended for everyday public traffic, no no gates at the front. And this is, you know, this is a, an extension of the urban environment. And I'll use the words ecumenical benefit here, right? That idea of blending of, of church life, spiritual life uh, and every everyday life. The pocket parks are really throughout um, the zone that's directly at the foot. Uh, the current steps here would be a smaller area a sort of more larger sort of wedge shaped park that's in here is another area. Uh, we've got a little corner zone over here. Uh, we have an interior sort of um, through alleyway that would be a, a, again a vista with no vehicle traffic, all pedestrians in a sort of tiered stepping, you know, very much like some of the things that you see throughout um, yeah. already. And then we have other just little smaller zones throughout. So somewhere between a recessed corner to a, a fairly, you know, I would say decent size, um, you know, um, you know, urban park, if you will, yeah. location. Okay, thank and you. Then and then you had shown a picture of one of the vias kind of looking toward the dome of the church with mm -hmm. a stair step. And I did want some clarity on that image. It's It looked to me like it's kind of a, a physical ascension of steps. No, that's just and, our lack of modeling capabilities in, in stepping in SketchUp's a lot easier than a draped uh, topography. Uh -huh. So uh, this is both for, for vehicles and pe people. Um, okay. And it would be stepped. It would be a, a, a slope. It would be a gradual street. incline. Yeah, okay. exactly. Great. Although I just wanted to make we, sure that we weren't creating kind of obstacles for um, right. pedestrians or people with mobility. Um, issues. And then can you talk about um, what plans you've built in around um, public transportation access to the facility and use of your, uh, you know, private roads for pickup and drop off and uh, kind of easing, easing the roadway 
congestion uh, already by providing more uh, off, maybe off roadway uh, opportunities for public transit pick up and drop off? We have, a, in terms of public transit, we're assuming that's at the perimeter. It's not to say that they couldn't make, uh, you know, ingress through the site. Um, and so in terms of public stops and bus stops and things like that, their current would be at the sort of perimeter. And it is under our requirements to uh, add and uh, improve, um, if my recollection's right, is, is, the, is it along Charlotte? I, I'm, I'm at a blank now for, um, there's some specific language that when the project does proceed, it has to improve uh, some of those stops. Um, in terms of accessibility, you know, we're anticipating multiple points at which people can uh, egress in as, and ingress egress through the site and not use the parking decks or use the parking decks. Um, you know, so that's maybe a separate from your question about public transit versus um, you know, ability to for parallel parking and access all along these perimeters and through the parking deck uh, through here at three points yeah, of access. Over and here. I just add to that, you know, that, um, a lot of those details we just haven't gotten to yet. Um, I mean, we certainly are, uh, are um, mindful of the requirements for our conditional zoning, but we would love to hear your ideas on, you know, how can we better plug in public transit um, communication with this with this project yeah i just those. you know i think ha having bringing bringing the mindfulness of like making public transit access easier um and and then also looking at where your residential occupation you know your residential use of space and context to public transits probably would be helpful um and then this might be a question that relates to kind of your your zoning permissions and kind of the site plans is designed. I mean, I heard you mention you know some landscape buffer and and some improved sidewalk, maybe spacing on Charlotte Street. But did have y'all given any consideration at all to concessions on kind of deeper setbacks that might ride, widen roadways generally to make the roadways um, leading to uh, the this kind of sweet spot and development even more inviting in terms of protected um, bikeways and, and sidewalks and and is it something you might be able to consider i'm not sure i understand the i understand the question but i don't know to what context so for example along oak and woodfin this is substantial uh right away where there's a, a, a pretty good we were probably 20 foot off of uh, face of building to edge of curb. So it's pretty substantial there for um, multiple levels of improvement, but the streets themselves are also pretty substantially wide and already have integrated uh, bike lanes. And so that's currently occurring here along. I think it's, uh, it's thinking Charlotte. more about um, more buffer, great, greater buffered bike lanes and, and sidewalks from the roadway. So, so thinking, uh, thinking more generously about it, I guess, is 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 the question I was asking, and if there's possibility for that, um, you know, which which might be you know a little bit deeper offset for some of the buildings from the roadway, and so I recognize it might not be possible, and yet I think it could der derive even greater benefit for the development itself and for the community. Yeah, some of it in some areas it could be possible. The one that we were assuming because of the greater right of way, and it, interestingly, what is along Charlotte because it is a, the largest right of way. Um, there is again, like I was saying here, around twenty foot from face of building to edge of curb. So there's some more flexibility there. But when you uh, you've all designed streets before, when you deal with twenty foot and you put eight nine foot in for a parallel parking. And then you also want to have 10 to 12 foot for a great uh, sidewalk in terms of having, you know, both throughways, uh, four top seating and so on and so forth. That 20 foot, you know, we're looking at it holistically, um, very pedestrian focused, not against bicycles or anything like that. But that's the sort of current dimensions that we're thinking about. We have not uh, looked at integrating uh, integrated like a five foot wide bicycle lane on our um property because we don't have that 
room. Um, the places where, you know, again, because we assumed it was already occurring on uh, Oak, Woodfin, and the perimeter streets. Okay. Well, I the, the last thought I had, and, and Jack mentioned it earlier, I'll just um, re reiterate that given, given the interest in kind of multiple uses in terms of office and retail and residential, having adequate um, bicycle infrastructure in terms of bike racks and um, or bike storage generally, I think is going to be an a well thought out uh, approach and in, in the early stage will probably help with that. And for and I wanted to go a little bit deeper and some of the reason why we thought that, you know, again, when you look at the existing right away that has turn turn lanes, pretty decent sort of drive lanes on both sides, integrated sort of bike lanes noted, um, you know, we're maintaining, you know, this buffer zones that are currently along the street, enhancing and widening those sidewalks uh, wherever possible, that there's a pretty substantial city right away here, uh, for example. Um, and believe it or not, where our site does start to get tight is when you go back and you look at our current foot footprints, these while are looking at approximately a 10,000 square foot footprint, which is pretty small. These are, I would call beyond boutique in their size. Um, we're down to pretty minimal uh, liner space to allow uh, feasible residential development. And then back to keeping these interior vias at a where we can have, you know, a, a nice 12 foot sidewalk where pedestrians can cross and path. Um, and we imagine these to be slow streets. So bikes would be welcome, you know, um, as you know, just as part of the everyday sort of uh, traffic. And then that's, I want to pivot back to um, Charlotte. You know, have y'all had any conversations or thought about the, the and I, I don't know if there's isolated comment that came up in some of our past meetings, but sort of really transforming um, Charlotte in, in a different way and more for bikes and so on and so forth that might have dedicated bike lanes or other ways of breaking down that right of way. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, there's certainly that conversation could certainly happen, but I think one of the issues we face there is 240 traffic coming off and you're adding another 1500, you know, vehicles to that load. Um, that might be a challenging area to be, uh, you know, taking some lanes away, but, um, you know, it's certainly something that we could talk about in the future. Um, just to kind of keep it moving. I know I don't want to keep you guys too much, but uh, Joe, do you have a, some comments? Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to kind of reiterate what Maggie started off with first. Um, and just a real quick, I, I kind of, uh, proposed this <laughs> to to Robert and David and and Furman and the development team uh, about a month ago. Um, there were we had some conversations at our PZC retreat with staff and um, both planning staff and and transportation staff um, about the possibility of bringing this and and having some input for multimodal. So I very much appreciate Robert, David, you guys taking the time out today, and also I know Paul Vest is is on the call. Um, and being willing to to have this conversation, I think it's super important um, because again, I, I love the fact you know that that uh, the pastor Mac calls this kind of an, an audacious project, and I've called it a transformative project. I mean, I really do think it it has it has the great potential to change this part of downtown and frankly all of downtown um, for the good. So yeah, just want to again thank the development team for this, and certainly. Um, also offer out that if anybody from multimodal has any, you know, further comments or questions, certainly you can reach out to me um, as the li liaison, the planning and zoning, um, you know, with any uh, thoughts you may have on this from that multimodal perspective. So thanks again. Thanks, Joe. Absolutely. Um, I have a couple quick, quick comments. Um, I, I really like how the interior streets and the slow streets idea, I think that's great. Um, and I just think it's important to be mindful of, you know, this is going to be a draw. And just as you were talking about, people will come here, do something here, and then, um, you know, partake in whatever's going on in the neighborhood and downtown. And so the pedestrian movements for those, for folks leaving this, this space and going downtown um, on the southwest side will be at Woodfin and Central. There's actually a little pedestrian um, throughway between the hotel and um, some other facilities. 
So I think right. you think about folks that are going to move away from your space to that space to kind of, you know, within one block, they're really in the thick of it in downtown. So it's something to consider, you know, we're going to see some people crossing that area. You know, I'm not sure how it can be happened, but that can all come together. But it's something I think to, you know, just be mindful of. Yeah, that's exactly right. what that space. That, um, that little shaving of the building that where I was trying, sorry for interrupting you, but I just, that angle of that building is not a mistake and it, it was designed to, as people are arriving through here um do have that sort of visual of the public park area as well as the steeple coming through and then you know the break in the building here which more pedestrian versus both pedestrian and vehicles here um and of course central over here sorry for yeah, and i think the city will probably have to figure out how to move those folks more safely if we're putting you know more folks coming in with vehicles into that right movement then right into the, the into the parking area you know we could figure that out but there will be a lot mm -hmm. of folks walking and then coming off of the hotel on the other side would be um you know taking kind of college street and i know that we're it gets a little bit tight there and the, the whole that whole section is it's not horrible but it gets a little tight so just to kind of be uh, mindful of the fact that exactly folks will be leaving there walking through the roundabout to town um you know there, there'll be a lot of foot traffic coming out there so i really like that idea i love the idea of the interior spaces wherever we can get some other pass through i think is really nice um you know i do feel like one of the concerns will be vehicle motions we're adding you know 1700 uh, vehicle trips into the area those motions would be coming probably right off of charlotte um when they're leaving they're not gonna be able, likely not gonna be able to make a left out of there so you know figuring out how we're gonna move those folks coming out and then the opposite side um, they'll be coming out probably left and then left onto Woodfin. So, you know, there's going to be, it'll be tight there, but I think it'll work out uh, really well. So um, thank you uh, very much for all this. I think it's really exciting. Uh, oop, one more comment, uh, Elise. Yeah, sorry. Um, I just have two kind of quick things. Uh, I also have the same concerns that were brought up about the, that, the, that bike parking hasn't been included in any of these calculations uh, yet. The idea of an additional 1,850 parking spots uh, definitely makes me a little uncomfortable knowing how people already talk about traffic downtown. And this seems to just add um, a, a more like just another centric kind of um, place. And that I hope we can think about this um, not just as oh, bicyclists are welcome, but actually encouraged um that that's just one thing i wanted to echo and then i do have a question if any of these parking garages will incorporate ev chargers i'm glad you you brought up parking garages um and the ev chargers we we haven't designed that i assume fully we will have ev uh infrastructure here um so i think that can be anticipated uh at least it's consistent with projects we're developing elsewhere it's kind of standard for us now um I, I will say, uh, and this goes quickly to a comment that was asked earlier, a question was asked earlier about public versus private. Um, currently, all the green spaces are private, but um, we certainly will, you know, there probably will be an opportunity to have more public-private partnership around some of these green spaces where we certainly need public-private partnership. And Maggie, we'll, we'll be coming to you in, in the near future um, we're working with city staff to, to really uh, develop the models for those parking garages and how um, partnership will be required for, for the whole project, but for a lot of that infrastructure. So I think that really becomes a public benefit. And so solving for bike storage, solving for bike parking, um, EV infrastructure, I think that really becomes a community collaboration point on, on, on these parking decks. Yeah, and we would be providing a substantial bike parking throughout. We just was describing the parking load. The eighteen hundred or so spaces that we have is is pretty substantially below the I think twenty two to twenty three hundred that you might have in a development of this scale. And so we've tried to balance. I think that puts us somewhere at about one per uh, one per thousand, which is pretty minimal parking for an overall uh, development. Um, you know, if you, that's and also on point to you know more moderate use in in current downtowns like you know i would say at nashville or charlotte um or other sort of um 
larger scale downtowns that are also trying to not overbuild their their parking, we would be below those those standards. Um, but we hear you loud and clear. Bikes are welcome and in another great way to help sort of share the burden. And there's many places that they could be integrated throughout the site for parking, uh, both in the parking decks and then, you know, in open areas. Um, and and I you know, love where Robert was going there and hearing you guys. Maybe there's other places like is there a sort of small bike shop kind of community focused place for people to have service done because, you know, you your tire went flat or whatever, those could be some other partnership opportunities. Um, so lots of opportunity here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you both uh, very much. We really appreciate the input. This is uh, super exciting and uh, we can't wait for it to be a part of our community. So thank you guys. Thank you. Happy to keep up with uh, whoever the, the appropriate liaison is and um, continue to receive your comments. Great. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you all. Cool. Thank you guys. Okay. All right. Our next item is, uh, Jessica, I did get your note about the public comment. Do you want me to read that now or should we wait till after these next few items? Um, I can go ahead and do the next uh, next couple of items very quickly okay, and um, and they're actually just going to be mostly a verbal update. Um, so for the city county joint transit planning project, we have been making some good progress in getting additional public uh, feedback or feedback from different organizations. Um, we, after we met with you guys um, at your last meeting in March, where we gave a presentation about the kind of the draft scope of work, we also did the same presentation to the Planning and Economic Development Committee, and that's a committee that's a subset of the council. Um, we did that on April 10th, and then we also attended the ART which is the Asheville Regional Transit Coalition. We attended that and gave a presentation on April 14th. Um, and we also will be going to um, the Community Transportation Access Board, I think is what it's called. I can't remember. It's um, the group that's actually um, a county committee that looks at transportation issues. We'll be going and doing a presentation for them on May 4th, and we'll be meeting with the Sustainability Advisory Committee, the SACI Committee, um, which is a, 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 a city commission um, on May 17th. And um, so far, I think a lot of the input that we've received is very similar to what we received from from the multimodal commission um, some of the comments that we've gotten include um, uh, you know wanting to see a focus on public engagement having a um, dynamic and i'll say a broad skill set comprised in the consultant team that ultimately we we hire for this project um, looking at not only our current service design for transit, but also all forms, different forms of service delivery models um, that might be available and good opportunities for us. Um, looking at various scenarios as part of the analysis and um, looking at the financial resources that are available both now and in the future that would ultimately help us implement the plan. Um, we also heard from folks um, similar to what we heard from you that we need to not only look at operations but look at the fleet and the facilities that support the operations and we should look at connectivity um, with bike bicycle and pedestrian um, and as well as park and ride opportunities and we also received some some input about wanting to see strategies for increasing ridership, decreasing the carbon footprint of our transportation system, 
and um, looking at the poten- potential benefit of um, a different governance model. So maybe perhaps a regional transit authority and um, the benefits of having and cost savings of having um, those different governance models. So we've received a lot of really good input and we're going to, after we, I think, conclude with the um, Sustainability Advisory Committee on May 17th, we're going to be meeting with the county staff and we'll be going over everything that we've received and then incorporate um, comments into our scope of work and start to put together a request for proposal. Um, and just a reminder that all of all of this work is dependent on and, and kind of assuming that we will get budget approval from the city council and the county commission. Um, and then after after that, we would be releasing that request for proposal. And I think that's it for that one. Does anybody have any questions or comments about that topic? Maggie. Um, so I'm thrilled this is moving forward and I'm hearing some from some folks on the county side that they're just kind of unclear and feel like the financial ask is a moving target and that's making them anxious about how clear communication will happen as we partner on this. So I mentioned this to Deborah and I just wanted to share to you as well, like the county really wants to make sure that this study doesn't paint them into a hole. And so being really clear is important. And I think they need to know really clearly how much the financial ask is, or at least the commissioners do, because um, I'm seeing some skepticism about moving forward that wasn't skeptic before because of some of this. So I just want that on your radar. Okay, well, that's news to me. Um, so cool. Thanks. You can, uh, I'll follow up with um, Rachel about that. Um, I know, I know that I've heard that some folks think that maybe the ask of $300,000 from each entity is too much. Um, and it may very well be. Maybe when we get proposals back, they'll come in lower than that. Um, but, you know, just basing it on different uh, and recent consultant costs and project scale, the, pro- the scale of this project, we felt comfortable with that number, but um, we won't really know until we get proposals back. So we'd be happy to talk more with um, county staff about yeah. it. Yeah, what I've heard from two different folks who said something of the tune of, I was told this would be 100,000. Now the city's telling me it's 300,000. What's going on? And um, Uh that could be true, that could not be, but it it was definitely, um, I want you to be informed that that's a conversation. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Um, and if there aren't any other questions about that topic, um, I don't really have a whole lot to share about the College Patton Downtown Bike Lane Project meeting. It's a lot of words, um, but and and unfortunately, I was unable to attend. But the event was um, on the I think it was on the 17th or the 19th. I forget what the 19th, and it was uh, well attended. From what I've heard, we had about 70 to 80 people attend um, both. I'll say both stakeholders or direct, directly impacted stakeholders that either own property or business or live on the corridors, um, and also other folks that are just interested in the project and in um, improving our bicycle network. So we have good attendance. Um, there was a lot of our city staff there from different departments, including fire, police, et cetera, to help answer questions. Um, and of course, transportation staff and planning and urban design staff were there as well. And so we um, 
we are compiling all of the information. There's a, uh, a survey that was provided at the meeting and I think on our project website as well. So we'll compile all that information and hopefully have a more robust um, uh, download of information for you guys at our, our May meeting. Um, and I think that's all I've got for um, any of these items. I don't think I have any other updates for any of these other items here, Dennis. Okay, great. Oh, Jack? Yeah, I was going to say I attended the event and uh, thought the city did a lovely job of presenting information clearly. Um, and I uh, just want to comment, I think it's, uh, uh, it looks like to be an amazing project um, and can have a huge impact on safety downtown. Thank you. Okay, the next item we did get, uh, so we did have a, a uh, some public comment that came in. It uh, addresses a an item that will likely be on our agenda next month. Uh, however, the commenter has requested that we read it today, so we'd be happy to do that, and I will do that now uh, to get it uh, onto our uh, record. Uh, so the comment goes, uh, my name is Patrick Condon, and I am a resident of East West Asheville. First, I want to thank each of you for volunteering your time and expertise to serve on this commission. At the April 11th meeting of the city, uh, Asheville City Council, item J on the consent agenda described the ordinance that would modify the UDO to introduce new criminal penalties for storage of bicycles, carts, strollers on city property. At, that, at the start of the meeting, at the council meeting, it was announced that the item had been pulled and would uh, refer to the multimodal commission for further study. First, I want to share some procedural concerns regarding this item. When I reviewed the agenda for the April 26th meeting of the MMTC, I did not see this item listed either under new business or future agenda items. Uh, I would encourage the commission to work to ensure your meeting materials provide clarity regarding the status of the meeting and any future items that are referred from city council to this commission. Furthermore, the city seems to have removed the ordinance from the published meeting materials for the April 11th meeting. Um, there's a link included. Uh, and then it goes on to say, as a result, I'm unable to share the direct link to the ordinance I'm describing. Perhaps city staff can provide you with a copy. Regarding the proposed ordinance itself, I understand the desire to preserve the availability of public space, including bike racks for the use of residents and visitors to our city. However, I am concerned that the proposed ordinance introduces a misdemeanor level offense for violations. I encourage this commission to consider the following questions. One, uh, if the goal of the ordinance to is to preserve public ac access to public amenities, why not implement this ordinance with a civil infraction fine as a penalty rather than a criminal misdemeanor? Uh, question two, should our city utilize limited public, uh, public safety resources to track down, to, uh, down and cite individuals who abandoned property for 72 hours prior? Uh, in 2020, Governor Cooper created a task force to explore measures to improve racial equity in the criminal justice system in North Carolina. You can view that full report at this link, link provided. I would, uh, I do want to highlight two recommendations included in their report, number 74 and number 75. These recommendations relate directly to the item under consideration by the MMTC as city staff have recommended that you at attach a criminal misdemeanor penalty to a local ordinance that does not directly impact public safety. And that is the close of his comments. Uh, Patrick, we appreciate your comments and your information, and we will uh, certainly consider them when we talk about this item next month. Thank you very much for your comment. Um, okay, we're kind of bumping up to it. Uh, so we have a few items. I just wanted to give one quick, uh, two quick updates. Number one is uh, a group of us met on the side uh, last uh, over the last couple of weeks to talk about the active transportation group. We met, uh, the, that uh, meeting included Claudia. Uh, we had some very good 
um, conversation. There's a document that's kind of coming together now. I hope to have something for you to for a group to look at um, by next month, and then I'll kind of move that process along, and hopefully we can have some uh, some more clarity on on what that's going to look like and how it's going to operate uh, going forward. Uh, the second item is um, uh, Pat Katz has resigned, so she'll be she'll be moving on, rotating off of our commission, and we will have an appointment coming up. Um, very soon, uh, I believe in the, maybe for the June meeting. So uh, that's the other item. And then without any other comments, we can move to adjourn. Anyone have any comments? All right, uh, we will move to adjourn. Um, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Aye. Excellent, motion has it. Thank you very much. Take care, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.